Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for the week beginning Monday the 18th of May and joining me on this edition, Steve Withers. Your ego's writing checks your body can't cash. Ed Selly. Negative Ghost Rider, the pattern is full. And Mark Buttright. This bogey's all over me. I think it's going to be quite easy to work out uh, this week's film. Uh, but anyway, we're live once again. If you are uh, watching us on YouTube, very good evening to you. Welcome along to the podcast. If not, if you're listening to us on audio, good evening as well. We're here. We're here all week, believe it or not. Um, we have the Q&A section this evening, and we're changing it up a little bit tonight. Um, so for those of you watching live and you want to ask us a hardware question, hi-fi um, or AV, um, you can do that in that section if you want to watch you want to ask uh, movies questions, you can also do that in the movies section. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight, just changing the format up a little bit there for you. Uh, we're also going to be discussing our favourite and worst Tom Cruise movies at the end of the podcast. So if you've got any ideas uh, or you any suggestions, put them in the chat window and we'll, uh, we'll get to them at the end of the podcast. Also, if there's any issues with the stream, if you could let us know this evening just in the comments section. Hopefully the audio is now all fixed and everything's working the way it should be. Uh, if that is the case, then great. If not, let us know in the comments. And also, please, if you are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, click the bell to be given notifications every time we go live with a new video. Um, and you can also donate. Um, there is a new Patreon um, donation as well. So as a few of you asked about that, um, it's now in the description. If you go to the uh, YouTube page and have a look at the description, it's in there as well. And if you subscribe to the audio version, um, we're still available on iTunes and Spotify and every other podcast provider out there. So uh, remember to keep subscribed to the podcast. It appears every Monday morning, the audio version for you. Um, so, yeah, I think that's everything caught up. Um, Super Chat. Forgot to mention Super Chat. Uh, basically, what that does is it makes a donation and it pops your question right up the top. And we'll get around to uh, answering that as soon as we can. So um, let's kick into the podcast. No cars this evening, but there's uh, the A-teams here still. So we're, we're all here raring to go this evening. And like I say, we're going to change the format up a little bit this week and just see how things go because um, what works for an audio podcast doesn't necessarily work for a video podcast and vice versa. So we're trying to find the balance. Um, so give us your feedback as well. Um, if, you, uh, if you have any ideas of how we could... Uh, change the format slightly so what we've been up to this week uh av hi-fi movie wise um what have we been doing steve movie wise i watched um he's not here unfortunately but i watched under siege oh, um good. which is all right i suppose <laughs> <laughs> i mean you know it's, it's one of those 80s, yeah it's one of those 80s classics that you need to be in the 80s to watch it I mean, it had two good things about it, and both of them belong to the actress playing the uh, girl that comes out of the cake. Uh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I think Tommy Lee Jones commits. No, yeah, he's having yeah. it up. The only performance that's more hammy than the one in that is the one he gives in Batman Forever. But I just don't get Steven Seagal. He's got the charisma of a brick. I, <laughs> I just find him to be an objectionable not, human not being. quite quite fat in that one um, he's not get, he's going there though he's wearing an apron quite a lot to kind of disguise it but um but uh yeah i mean the pitch quality was pretty ropey too oh, wasn't no, it? I, think you see, you I thought that, that was half the experience the fact that the amazon version of it looks like a vhs a, a hooky vhs <laughs> one. all that's missing is is it, it to cut into late night advert breaks um you know from the mid 90s to see, really I always... give I always think it should have right at the end. Please rewind this tape. <laughs> Be kind, rewind. Yeah, actually, uh, Marcus Barnes is correct in us. He's saying it was 1992, not the 80s. Close enough. Close enough. I, I yeah. mean, I, I'm a sucker for battleships. What can I say? I mean, that's why I was prepared to watch the film Battleship. Um, uh, so, you know, I, it's fantastic. And uh, it, it, it came at a weird time in, uh, in US political sort of a military history where they sort of were willing to let anything go. I don't think you would get that sort of unfettered access and, and permission to just dick about on a, an enormous <laughs> piece of military hardware in the same way that they did in that film. I just, also, not like exactly that. shining the US Navy in a, in a good light with given the, uh, was a basically a mutiny on board the ship. <laughs> I'm amazed they let them shoot on it. I mean, they, they did whatever they liked, didn't they? They were sitting in, 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 in uh, harbour most of the time 
which is pretty obvious on occasion. No, absolutely. Then obviously not doubt it. So. <laughs> I mean, I think the moral to this is 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 don't let Gary Boosie near any serious command. Because, um, <laughs> well, when he turns up in a dress and a big pair of fake bosoms, you're like, uh, yeah, this, is clearly, this man's clearly the full ticket and should be in command of a, of a warship in possession of nuclear-tipped missiles. That's not I like to think he just turned up on set like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that wasn't in the script. That was no. definitely not in the script. <laughs> the look on the captain's face when he comes in the door <laughs> to take him to his surprise party, dressed <laughs> like that, is an absolute picture. It's it's a passable action film. Unfortunately, it's quite heavily cut in this country, um, yes. which annoyed the hell out of me. I hate it. One of it. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot oh, of the yeah. violence is cut. Um, and it hasn't been reinstated, bizarrely, although, as Ed's pointed out, I think that might have been a copy from 1992 anyway, yeah. so <laughs> that's well, they probably why. The bandsaw. Uh, yeah, and also when he tears someone's throat out at one point, yeah. there's lot, lots of violence. Um, yeah, which is which is, which annoyed me. Anyway, I, I watched that, um, and then um, I put some more speakers on the ceiling. So that was all the other job I did. <laughs> <laughs> there's six of them up there now. Connected <laughs> them up or just put them up there? Uh, they're wired, but um, <laughs> but I need a bit more amplification before I can actually run them. So. All but right, so you'll be begging for more amps. Yeah. <laughs> um, movie wise I'm just looking through the running order so uh, the, there have been a few top 10s and um, Guilty Pleasures and What's On um, so uh, Andy's been putting together some of the What's On uh, Netflix and Amazon um, so look out for those it's everything for the month that's coming up um, Top Secret appearing on Amazon Video which uh, he yeah, highlighted from the 10th of May um, it's good that one I, w- I watched that as well <laughs> <laughs> it is really funny. Uh, there's just so many gags in it. Some of them are downright surreal. There's a punch up underwater at one point, which is funny, and also a bit. Well, the entire Peter Cushing sequence is shot back. Is is, is you know was shot in reverse, um, uh, and then uh, in in a single take. Um, and there's loads of really great sight gags too. Um, it's 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 a it's a very funny film. Um, and it, it's the first film that Val Kilmer ever did. It's his first film, and he sings, he dances, he lands the jokes, deadpans it. He's brilliant. Why didn't that boy become a big star? Probably because I've... he turned out to be a massive idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, obviously, you haven't changed what you've been doing this week, then, Steve. From every other week that's uh, that's gone past so far, you're still happy sitting watching TV and projectors. Yeah, around. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, why is something going on? <laughs> this is what yeah. I've been doing. I, for the last 10 years. <laughs> for, for this week, I have struggled to sit down and watch anything. I just, I don't know why it is. I think it's just my patience has just gone completely. Um, I'm sitting down and I'm just, I'm just not, not in the frame of mind for it. And I've got loads to watch as well. Um, so no, I've spent the last week just working, uh, doing videos, uh, reviews and sorting out, trying to sort out uh, review samples and stuff coming through. So things are starting to ease off a little bit. Um, business is starting to open up again. Um, we looks like we're going to start getting more equipment through. I don't know what about the other guys here, but certainly uh, there's more offers starting to come in now. So hopefully we'll start to see uh, the TVs, definitely the TVs. Um, there's things in the pipeline there. So hopefully uh, that's going to progress as the week goes on uh, next week and hopefully we'll have some stuff in for review that we can tell you about next week. It's a shame that Kaz is not here because there was a whole section that we were going to talk about his uh, guilty pleasure movies um, such as Seagull and Statham and, and all that kind of thing. We'll leave that to next week um, when Kazi's back because uh, I'd like to get his input on those. Um, so let's move on to some hardware stuff um, and talking about TV Steve, uh, TCL now TCL are great at issuing press releases they're great at doing videos and interviews and all the rest of it. Um, have you seen any product from them yet for review? Almost. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better they, than uh, nothing. So. Yeah, true. They sent me a TV um, a few weeks ago for review. Uh, unfortunately, they sent me the wrong television, it turned out. The one they promised didn't turn up, but something else did. Uh, and then when I set it up, it was broken. So, uh yeah, uh, I have received a TV from TCL. I have yet to actually review a TV from TCL. Well, you got one stage further than, than I did because <laughs> I, I did the whole video conference. That, well, wasn't it? It was just a telephone conference with the product manager. I talked about the product. It, it'll be coming forward and it's never turned up. So unfortunately, we haven't seen any TCL product to really sort of get in and talk about it because the only TCL product I have actually seen working has been um, on the show floor at CES. So um, I don't particularly know 
an awful lot about the models other than the American models, which I see a lot of discussion about. Uh, the models are actually coming to UK and Europe. Um, I don't know that much about them. Do you, Steve? Uh, no, not really. Um, I've seen, uh, I know that they be, they're doing a similar thing to Panasonic and Philips. They're going to be doing both uh, Dolby Vision and HDR10 Plus, some of their TV. So that's good news. Um, and I know they've got uh, some sort of low end LCD and some higher end um, LCD TVs in the pipeline. Plus, I mean, they just announced a couple of Q, uh, QLED TVs, so Quantum Dot TVs. But I mean, that's about it as far as, I, as, far as I'm aware. Do you know anything else? No, <laughs> not, not a lot. Um, so we want to find out more about uh, the TVs. They have uh, announced models that are coming out. So the C71, C81, 4K QLED TVs, um, they will be coming to the UK. Um, if, if Steve's able to quickly go through the specs on that, that would be great while I read out, because I've just noticed we've had a, a donation come in. So I'll read this out while Steve quickly looks at the specs of those TVs. Yeah. So, yeah. Adrian Califf, um, um, £20 you've donated there. And you've got a question. We'll come on to that because it is an absolute cracking question. We'll come on to that in the hardware section. Um, so hopefully Steve's now opened up the page and he can tell us some specs yeah, of yeah. uh, yeah, C71 and C81, um, they're both QLED TVs. And as I said a, a few minutes ago, they support Dolby Vision and HDR10+. Plus. They'll also include, include Freeview Play, uh, Dolby Atmos, and um, an Onkyo sound system. So actually, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, uh, Apple, no. And uh, Android, Android 9.0 as well. And, uh, and also Chromecast, Google Assistant, and Alexa support. So I've got to say, specs-wise, that, that's pretty yeah. good. It does read good. It, it does. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if we can get these models in for review, which I hopefully we will. Um, we'll certainly speak to, to Marek, who's appeared on a few of our videos, and see if we can get those TVs in for review. And if we can, we'll certainly uh, certainly have a look at those. Um, and soundbar-wise, Steve, um, mm -hmm. put a Denon review up this morning from you. Yep. Um, there's we also talked about that about four weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it's the way things have been going. We've got lots of top tens and everything else. So the homepage, is, and then we had all those Star Wars movies. Um, so the homepage just got incredibly busy. Um, so it went up today, um, and there's more sound bars coming along that you've been looking at as well. We've certainly got the Sharp that's coming up, um, which looks like an interesting sound bar. Sony announced did the I sound talk about bar. That? I talked about that last week, didn't I? Yeah. You did, yeah. So uh, yeah. Sony have also announced um, the HTG700, which is a 3.1 channel Dolby Atmos sound bar, which is going to be approximately 450 quid. Can I just uh, clarify when it says Dolby Atmos? Obviously, it's 3.1 channel, so the yeah. Atmos is being done via psychoacoustic process not using yeah. actual upward firing drivers. So. I was just going to come on to that because I've also got a 5.1 soundbar out, which is the S20R. Um, so, yeah, there's a 3.1 and the 5.1 soundbars. It doesn't say whether the S20R is Dolby Atmos or not. It's only got Dolby Atmos against the 700, so we'll need to... I don't to... think it is. I look, it looks like the S HT s 20 r is, is 5.1 in the sense it's three channels at the front, so left, right, and centre, a subwoofer, and two uh, wireless rear speakers. Um, but yeah, you're right. It doesn't I don't think it's a bizarrely. Yeah, that's that's two hundred about two hundred and fifty. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, in. It's, I think that one's got rears, hasn't it? And the, yeah, the Atmos yeah. one doesn't. Yes, that's correct. Weirdly, <laughs> so the Atmos uh, one with no rear speakers is four hundred and fifty quid, and the non-Atmos one with rear speakers is two hundred fifty quid. I don't understand Sony's no. thought process there. I don't. At all. I don't understand that one either, and. I suppose we're getting to a point now, Steve, with the sound bars and so on. That, and I saw the question on the forums. I don't know if it's made its way into the chat this evening or not, but I have certainly saw it in the forums this week. Somebody was asking the question. It might even have been on your uh, Denon review uh, comments. Why has one company not just come up with a full package, including uh, auto EQ and and just you know a full full package sound bar with everything on it, including uh, room setup and room EQ? Has yeah, that, market, yeah. That, that, would, that would be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, com some companies have come close. Um, certainly, Samsung, their flagship soundbar, you know, is is uh, was it five point one point four? So proper Atmos, and it does DTSX as well. Um, I believe it's just had an EARC update. So <laughs> well done there. Um, and um, 
Uh, uh, yeah, but it's one downside. It, it doesn't have a, a decent setup, you know, e, um, auto EQ or anything like that. So it's not perfect, although it's probably the closest right now in terms of delivering a genuine, you know, Atmos DTSX package from a soundbar and, and, and approaching affordable price. Uh, Mark has just donated ten pounds. I've just seen it pop up on the screen here. Mark, thank you very much. It really is appreciated. Thank you for all the laugh out loud moments uh, I've had listening to the podcast over the years whilst driving to work. Cheers, Some of guys. them would have been um, deliberate as well. Um, yeah, only a couple <laughs> probably. Of time, so. Thank you very much for the donation, Mark. It is uh, really is appreciated. And um, don't know if you're still uh, driving to work at the moment or not. But um, <laughs> hope you're not watching this while you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that could cause some issues. Um, Ed, you've been looking at some, uh, well, we've got exclusive on this, some new headphones yes. from uh, Campfire Audio. Yes, uh, they have been updating some existing models and releasing an entirely new one. Um, we uh, selected, we, I, with your consent, selected the Andromeda, uh, the 2020 model. This was simply because it's closer in price to some other models that we've actually looked at already. Um, so there was some more meaningful comparisons to make. Um, uh, the review's up, uh, so there's no spoilers on this one. It's a monumentally good product. Um, at less uh, significant price tags, uh, I do tend to make more of a play of the fact when these devices are wired only. If you're spending £1,100 on a pair of earphones, um, really, you will still be using a conventionally wired system. So it's less of, a, less of an issue, conversely, the more expensive it becomes. They are monumentally good. Um, what I genuinely admire is they're sensitive enough that you can attach them to some fairly middling headphone amplifiers, if your phone still has one, um, and they work pretty well. And then you can connect them to something uh, uh, rather more sort of hefty, um, and they will just they exponentially improve what they do. They are phenomenally good. They're well made. They're comfortable. Uh, I'm not wildly keen on the case, which is made out of cork. Uh, and a bit weird, but um, that's the summation of things that I found wrong with them. Uh, the review is up on the site. Thank you for the um, the, the comments and the feedback. Um, someone did ask a very reasonable question. Uh, you know, how much better are they than the model that's outgoing? Because there are some savings on the outgoing model. Unfortunately, that's not something that I'm in a position to tell you immediately. I don't think there was much wrong um, with uh, the originals, if I'm honest. I will say that these are pound for pound the best earphones I think I can remember using but that doesn't mean that the originals aren't going to be extremely good so if you can get a decent price on them I don't think you're going to be disappointed um that's not to, just out of interest um we in the tank ready to go up is a review of the new PMC 2521i um before the um outbreak the event uh PMC was very very keen for me to go along and listen to um the new one back to back with the old one they were absolutely they're absolutely determined to 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 ram home the differences that they made so manufacturers where possible it's something that they're aiming to do but at the moment it's just all a bit all over the place so i'm afraid it's not something that i can uh, can do all the time so uh, yes um uh, the review is up. If you've got any comments, questions, uh, I mean, so, someone's just asked in, in the in the, the thing, are we a law of diminishing returns? It applies to everything. Uh, applies to earphones, headphones, the whole lot. Um, are these three times better than the Campfire Audio IO at 350 quid? No, of course not. Uh, but they are better. Um, they respond to uh, better partnering equipment. Your point where the law of diminishing returns sets in is going to be different and it's going to be a highly personal thing and it's going to vary from piece of equipment to piece of equipment. Uh, there is no substitute uh, for visiting a dealer uh, and actually trying to work out where you stop finding the benefit in spending money because it's a priceless and very useful thing to know because it can end up saving you a fortune. Uh, anything else you've been up to this week? I, I noticed that Richard Sim Sevens just said that you've obviously gone a bit far with your chili this week. Well, yes. Um, I managed to get my barbecue running for the first time in two and a half years. Um, it's in my old neighbour's garden for most of those two years because I didn't take it with me to the shed. Uh, so I had to clean horrible things out of it. It required a huge <laughs> amount of work to get that up and running. But that was um, – I, I, I uh, did, a, did a chicken on it just as a sort of test test run yesterday that went went really well so i'll do something uh more... i have to be honest ed when i saw that photograph it did look a bit pink no to me. no, no, no. it's, the, it's the color that um 
that's this essentially because it's low temperature it's never going to go uh, unless you put a huge amount of smoking wood on it it's not going to go that dark but i can assure you it was temperature tested all the way through to the right. core because uh, salmonella is not high on my list of things to do as a weekend you really <laughs> don't want to get <laughs> sick right now do you <laughs> No, no. no. Um, but guilty pleasure. I mean, it popped up on. I had, I had to point this out on Twitter. I was pottering through the Amazon selection, and I was thinking, oh, I'll, I'll find something for half an hour and go to bed. And of course, I found Twister. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, the unwritten rule of Twister is that when you yeah, find you Twister, Twister, you must sit down yeah. and watch Twister. Yeah. Um, I mean, what a, what a little gem of a film that what is. A I mean, cast. what a cast yes, list for a B absolutely. movie. You think? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It makes um, me sad now, though, because old Bill Paxton's gone. The extreme is no longer with us. And so, Philip Seymour uh, Hoffman. He's not. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, it's uh, I, I, I did that. Um, I've been playing a fair amount of Gran Turismo. Um, still annoys me, but uh, yeah, I'm still playing <laughs> that. So, um, yeah, I can't help myself. Um, so, what yeah. is it that annoys you? Uh, I miss the, the originals were absolutely unconcerned about fairness if yeah. you wanted to take a 600 horsepower racing car and race family hatchbacks you could it just sort of yeah. shrugged its shoulders and went yeah all right it's not much of a competition but you do you these ones it's all points related and there's different performance classes and there's no grid start and that really annoys me because essentially it just means that the entire race is a pursuit and very you know it's it's rare to have more than two cars in, in 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 sort of competition with you at any given time and i just find that that misses out on some of the excitement but it's better than the last version of gran turismo that i remember playing where it really was set up so you just encountered one car a lap and it was tedious um so yes i've been giving a reasonable amount of time to that um and uh yeah uh, i mean it, it it's a bit weird because uh, it should have been the munich show this it should be ending now um, so I had to make myself an enormous batch of asparagus soup to, uh, you know, I was going to, you're going to say German sausage <laughs> <laughs> to feel, um, to feel, uh, to, to feel sort of, you know, vaguely Bavarian. Um, uh, and it's a real shame because I think it would have been, been a good one for product announcements, but as you say, things are starting to ease up a bit. Um, and hopefully, yeah, we'll, we'll start to start to see some stuff coming through and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll factor it into, to reviews and content. I went up uh, to get my shopping at Tesco on Saturday, Ed, and I sent you a message straight away because the KFC was open. Mm. The drive-thru was open. I saw. I, I, and I, the I, traffic was round the block for it. I mean, oh, I don't go at the best yeah. of times. There was no way I was sitting in a Lincoln <laughs> queue for a bit of chicken. KFC. No. <laughs> so. The thing is, KFC is, it smells. There's no mm. getting around that. So I tend to eat KFC in KFC. I don't but, want the smell of dirty chicken in my car or my house. Eating in your garden. Well, well, yeah. What I will say, though, is it's better than that Popeye stuff that we had in Vegas. That was awful. Ah, uh, well, you see, I learned the lesson there. We sh we went for the plain coating, and you should go for the spicy coating. Um, that, that's We made a schoolboy error right at the start of our Popeye selection process. So, <laughs> um, But, uh, no, I mean, I actually, I, I say about making my house smell. Sorry, I, I just had a massive flashback to that Popeye's. I, I, I'm already, I'm yeah. feeling unwell again. <laughs> yeah, but we, we were unwell. So no, I know, but that did I, not help. <laughs> it was, it probably tasted worse than it actually did because we couldn't taste I much couldn't because taste of the cold. thing. <laughs> I um, I I did an Indonesian fish curry last night, and it's taken quite a lot of open windows and and aerating to get get the house. Um, it it, it did smell yeah, we could like see a, behind you. It did smell like a Balak Papan fishing trawler this morning, so I um, it, it took a bit of work to get that sorted. Um, really tasty though, <laughs> cracking recipe. So um, yeah, um, that's that's what I've been been up to. There's loads of content of mine in the tank because um, the campfires were done uh, as a sort of, of time, expedite, yeah. expedited review. So there's still four to go up, and I'm in the process of writing more. So you know, yeah. uh, well, I mean, it, it is mid month, and um, I think I've only got one more thing of yours in the CMS, Steve. Um, still expecting stuff coming in. Uh, so Ed, what have you got to wrap up this month in terms of review wise? Uh, do you mean stuff that's in the tank ready to go up or that I'm writing yes, now? Yes, stuff that will be ready for the end of the month, basically. Oh, ready for the end of the month. Uh, we've got the flagship Eclipse single driver speaker, the uh, TD712Z. Uh, we've looked at the smaller ones, so we've gone all in, £3,500 uh, each, and they are available singly for people looking at them for a, a 
the extreme multi-channel experience. Uh, we've got uh, the £3,000 integrated amp from Riga, the Ethos, one very, very eagerly anticipated product. Um, uh, we've got a DAC from German company T plus A, um, a company which has struggled. Say, just say T and A. Struggled with some 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 you know translation issues with the name over the years, um, but nevertheless, it's a it's a it's a good product. Um, and then I'm going to write a column on something, and I haven't decided what that is yet, but it'll be it'll be great. Maybe one of the one of the uh, questions here will trigger something. No, no, no. There's all sorts of all sorts of ideas, sort of popping up in the uh, in the thing so uh well since we're talking about reviews i'd just like to answer james houston's question denim makes pretty decent soundbars soundbar examples but i have not seen them mentioned very often or even reviewed your thoughts my thoughts james are look at the front page <laughs> <laughs> one yeah, there it, that went up this morning it went up this morning mate um so it is there but yes i know i know what you're saying um the uh, they're few and far between the reviews, and that's just because there's not a lot of uh, sound bars to cover. And if we covered them all at once, there'd be nothing else for Steve that's to do during the week. So, <laughs> so what? Yeah. So what have you got coming up uh, that's going in for the end of the month, Steve? Uh, there's going to be let me see, uh, Vizio. Oh, no, have I done Vizio already? No, no. Vizio, Vizio Sharp, I think. Um, Am I? What day is this? I can't, I can't remember what I'm doing this week. Um, oh, I, can't, I can't remember. It's their stuff. It's their stuff it. I can't, I'm top made. I can't remember what it is, but you know, it's, it's going to be lovely. glorious. Yeah. It'll yeah. be great. <laughs> oh no, um, uh, SVS sub um, the the PC two thousand. That's right. one of them. SVS okay. sub. I think I think a couple of subs and a couple of soundbars. So I think it's SVS rel. And then, um, yeah, the, the Sharp and the Vizio soundbar. So that's what I think that's what's going to be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about a projector uh, when we get to hardware. And also, um, at the moment, I am speaking to Sony, LG, and Panasonic, and Hisense. So there's possibilities of TVs coming in from, from those. At the minute, we're just trying to figure out deliveries. Because as you can appreciate, at the moment, uh, some deliveries need to be contactless. I need to get TVs up the stairs. They can only be 55 inch or below for that to happen. So we're currently trying to figure that out. But you know, you'll be the first to know as well because we'll uh, we'll let you know next week what, what we have got in for review. Do the uh, world's first outdoor TV testing. <laughs> I'd be interested when it's raining, Mark. That would be that would be really. <laughs> I wouldn't want to touch the TV at that point. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's a test that none of our competition do. We, there might be an yeah. undiscovered, undiscovered uh, uh, area of thoroughness <laughs> here. You know, but. Yeah, I, I'm not volunteering for it anyway. Um, so that's what we got coming up. Um, there's also some interesting audio products. Possibly, we've been waiting for them to turn up for a while, so I'm not going to mention them just quite yet, and unless because it might fall through again. But there's some interesting processors supposed to be coming. Um, it might be next month before we look at those. But um, but certainly that's again something else has been discussed at the minute. Uh, games news. First time we've done games news for a while, Mark. It was that my intro? Yeah, <laughs> <That's it. laughs> checking you're on your toes. Right, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, Unreal Engine Five has been shown off by Epic Games, uh, running in real time on the PlayStation Five, and it's it's caused a bit of a stir, largely because it, it's kind of showing what we might come to expect of next generation graphics, and uh, although it, it's it's kind of cause a little bit of a bit of umbrage amongst some saying well why is it running on playstation 4 well, it's, it had to be shown on something and it's going to be uh scalable so it's going to go all the way down to android and ios devices but it's going to obviously be on xbox series x and pc as well um it was called lumen in the land of nanite and basically these fancy little terms if you want to dig down into it, it's to do with their own lighting technology and, and how that's going to affect things along kind of like along lines of ray tracing, although it wasn't shown with ray tracing. And some people said, well, it's only running at 1440p. But in short, it looked absolutely fantastic. And it, it's very easy to kind of uh, uh, get quite cynical about these things and say, well, it's never going to look like that. But go back and look at some of the PS4 tech demos at that blew you away kind of seven years ago and you'll realize that we'd surpassed that so long ago you know stuff like god of war and you know uh horizon and the like so 
this, you know, if if this is the level of detail that we've we've got coming, this is going to be an absolute golden age again, I think. Really, I, and I know I'm easily affected by hype. I know that. I counted up the number of Nintendo consoles I've owned the other day, and I, I don't want to go into how easy I'm swayed <laughs> by these things. But yeah, it it just it looked absolutely fantastic, and I, I can't wait. And they, also, the the really interesting thing was there was a particular shot where a character shimmies through. It was kind of like an uncharted Tomb Raider type demo. A character shimmies through a small gap and everyone assumed that that was to hide a loading screen. And Epic had to come out and say, actually, no, it's, you know, there was no loading screen there. We just wanted to show up close what, what the detail of the wall looked like. <laughs> and apparently because of the uh, solid state drive, particularly in the PS5, we could be saying loading screens are a thing of the past, which is... It, it's amazing to think that it could be like the kind of, uh, I think someone likened it to the lifts in uh, Star Trek where, you know, as soon as the door closes, you're there at the next floor, you know, so there's no reason to bother having any kind of a buffering screen. And, and yeah, going back to kind of old games and you realize just how, how they try to hide everything behind doors and slow opening animations and the like. And yeah, I'm suitably excited. Good. It pays to be excited about something in these interesting times. I, I've just realised that on a video podcast, me and Steve have to look interested. <laughs> 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 Which I, I'm going to apologise, but games never been my thing. So yeah, well, if, if I bought, suddenly glaze I've over, seen, then I'm sorry. I've also bought Animal Crossing on the Switch. Well, so has everyone else. I don't even know what I, you you tried to explain to me what it is, and it uh, does it doesn't sound like a game in any imagine, meaningful sense it just sounds like farmville imagine all the things that you do in real life that you don't want to do that you put off and now put them in a virtual form <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh that, that's it, just in, life as as in I the same say. way that my son loves virtual office on the yeah. playstation 4 and it's like mate well i mean if nothing else you know the, the future's looking good for you but um <laughs> that's a bit yeah. like you hear about the the playstation plus games that were supposed to come out in may no, it, there was a, a supposed leak showing that it was going to be. I think it was Dying Light and um, Dark Souls remastered, and everyone <laughs> got ridiculously um, excited for it. And then it came out, and it was Farming Simulator. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, again, my son bloody loves Farming Simulator, and yeah. um, what I uh, admire is his ability to to drive the game well beyond its design limits you could leave him for 10 minutes and you'd come back and he'd inevitably managed to have a piece of extremely expensive farm equipment on its roof <laughs> <laughs> it's um it was it, you know i don't necessarily think that agriculture is his future but i i admired his his commitment to destroying farm equipment it was it was good so and aren't those things they're massive money spinners the farm simulators the train simulators people spend a lot of money on them but then if if you look at if you it's quite sad you know you don't really want to kind of open the box and, and, and look inside and, and break all the mystery of it but if you boil down what a game is it's a series of little chores yes. that it's sent to do so much of <clears throat> games are built up like that it's like one of the reasons i'm currently playing through red dead redemption 2 and spending most of my time playing poker but it's little things like oh now you've got to eat and you just think <laughs> Why do I have to do this in a game as well? <laughs> now collect mushrooms, and it, you just you know, at a, at a given point, you're doing more work in a game to have fun. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's just a strange want world. to shoot something. That's all. <laughs> well, did you see? Um, was it? Uh, so you seem to be able to get Grand uh, Grand Theft Auto Five um, yeah. for free. If you're a PC, or I know you're you 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 lot of Mac users, aren't you? But it would appear to be that it's currently available for now via some channel. If uh, if you want to just shoot things, Steve, that is pretty much your go-to for for needless and catastrophic violence. That's if that's if you can actually download it, because unsurprisingly, it crashed their site. Yes, although so I, I understand on, at on the Steve's time of broadband, start it now, mate. <laughs> oh, my broadband's fine. These oh, is days. it all right now? It's on four G, like fifty or sixty. Ah. Like, sometimes yeah. 80 on a good day Depends. Yeah. get you okay. there we go uh, right to wrap up this section which has gone on for 34 minutes <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's usually 10 minutes but anyway we've we've been, we've been swapping it up a little bit um podcast steve read this raised this one because um 
obviously you can now watch us on the podcast, but podcasts are becoming popular again. They, uh, they were popular about 10 years ago, then there was a bit of a dip, and now they're becoming very popular again. So Steve posed the question, what podcasts are we listening to in lockdown? Um, I don't listen to any other podcasts. I do occasionally dip in now and again, but I haven't recently been listening to anything of note um, that I'm going to mention here. Um, so what have you been listening to, Steve? Well, on a regular basis, I listen to Pod Save America, Pod Save the World, um, America Dissected, which is all, these are all crooked media um, productions. Uh, so Pod Save the, America is basically about US politics, but it's always quite interesting. It's done by a bunch of guys who were in the Obama administration, so obviously it's got a left-leaning bent, but um, but they, they, they know what they're talking about, and I just love hearing people have a go at Trump, to be honest. Uh, Pod Save the World is a couple of the same guys, plus a guy called Ben Rhodes, who was, again... A, uh, in the um, in the Obama administration, I think in the intelligence part of the Obama administration, and again they cover world events. Um, again, it's really interesting. America Dissected is by a guy called um, Abdul Al Sayed, who's a doctor. He's an epidemiologist, so he did one last year, a series last year about the American health system, and obviously this year he's doing it all about COVID. So he gives it's a great podcast with some really interesting insight into well, it's obviously US centric, but it gives you some interesting insight into into COVID nineteen and the and the, the battle against it um, and how it's impacting the health system in the, in the US. So that's really good. Um, but the podcast that I have been listening to. Uh, basically, um, I binged it on Monday. So I was going to mention it under what I've been doing this week, but I thought I'd wait for this section. Um, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a crooked media production, but it's called Wind of Change. And it's an eight-part podcast, uh, about 45 minutes each in length. Uh, you can listen to it for free on Spotify. You haven't got a Spotify account, you can still listen to it. So you can just go and binge it on Spotify. And basically, it's, it's actually a podcast by a guy who's a, a proper serious journalist who just finished a book about the Troubles in Northern Ireland and did one previously about the triads in the US. But uh, a friend of his is, used to be in the CIA. And about 10 years ago, he told him that the other guy he knows who's in the CIA had told him that the CIA wrote the song Wind of Change by the Scorpions. And he's been obsessed with this rumor ever since. And this, doc, this, um, <laughs> this podcast is about his... You know, his, his, him chasing the great white whale of this rumor that he's been obsessed with and finding out whether it's true or not. And it's absolutely brilliant. It goes into loads of tangents about, um, you know, th about the, the U.S. use of uh, of um, popular me popular um, music and, and other medium uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool during the Cold War. It uh, it goes into the M Moscow Peace Festival, which was a, a massive heavy metal concert held in 89 uh, that was supposed to be anti-drugs, even though all the uh, artists involved were off their heads. Um, it's just, it's really funny. It's basically like Spinal Tap meets all the President's Men. And it is absolutely brilliant. It's without doubt the most enjoyable podcast I've heard in years. Uh, and um, and it took my mind off all this stuff for a bit. And uh, I, I recommend it highly. Please Go and listen to it. You won't regret it. You'll enjoy it. It's a brilliant. It's you know, it's one of those things where it's not the destination. Ultimately, it's the journey, and it's a great journey. And uh, I loved it. Okay. Cool. Uh, anybody else been listening to the podcast, Mark? I have. I have. Oh, 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 hang on. Oh, Mark, oh, you've, you've oh, exploded. Gone old. Gone old. We'll come back to you, Mark. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, sod> Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. Yeah, you've gone, you've gone a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the dangers yeah, right. of doing things live. Yeah, um, we don't even so, have children and animals, and we've managed to screw it up. So uh, yeah, yeah know, just just hit mute for a second there, Mark, because there's some uh, some noise coming some through in that as well. Uh, we'll come back to you in a sec. Ed, do you listen to podcasts at all? Only one. Um, ironically, uh, I gave it a spin because I was just at a loose end. Uh, it's called Smith and Sniff, uh, and it's Johnny Smith who has periodically appeared on um, uh, uh, like Fifth Gear and, and, and other motoring programs. And uh, Richard Porter, Sniff Petrol. I've actually um, watched it because is it they audio do on YouTube? They do YouTube. Yeah, I've seen uh, they, it on well, YouTube. they've they've had to pivot to podcasts because they can't go and shoot any more videos. Now, right. here's the weird thing: I have never truly enjoyed the videos that much. Um, it's not a medium that I I, I spend time I've got doing. To say, I watched I watched a couple. I thought they were entertaining. Uh, there was no pool for me to go back and watch anymore. I've thoroughly enjoyed the podcasts because it's just them talking bollocks, um, and I can relate okay. to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, that was um, yeah, it was good. Um, I've I've enjoyed that. I also uh, 
if you've got a uh, Kindle Unlimited account, uh, Richard Porter, Sniff Petrol, has compiled a list of obscure and pointless car facts. And it's just joyous. It's just, it's stuff that you could bore people into a coma with. And I'm, I am always there for that. It's fantastic. Uh, so that's well worth a look as well if you're... Um, if you've got an hour to kill, but no, that's it. I, uh, it sounds weird for someone that records a podcast every week. I don't then listen to other people's very often. So, um, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a telling thing, but, um, it, it's, it, the problem is if I've got the opportunity to sit down and listen to something, I'll listen to music. So it's rare indeed that I'll listen to, I don't, I don't listen to talk radio. For, I mean, the only time I listen to the today program, for example, is if I'm driving a car in the mornings, which obviously I don't do anymore at the moment so yeah that's it I, I that that's that's the sole entry in my in my list of podcasts okay uh if you like car stuff i do listen to um behind the glass which is uh, sam's channel sam who does seen through glass um he's one of the only car youtubers i've actually got time for that i'll actually go back and and watch over and over and over again uh, apart from hoopties i love hoopties um but yeah, it's the it's the only podcast I've I've listened to recently. Um, so anyway, we need to wrap up on that because we're going way over time. Hopefully, Mark's going to sort his audio issue uh, and come back. So in the meantime, Ed's going to do the competitions because I was going to get Mark to do it, but um, oh, we're having right, technical on. issues there. So Ed's just going to quickly bring up his running. No, no, no. Duties. Here we go. Uh, right, current competitions. You can win a copy of 1917 on Blu-ray, which is open to the 16th of June. You can win a copy of The Specialists on Blu-ray, which is open to the 10th of June. You can win a copy of Throwdown on Blu-ray, which is the 9th of June. You can win a copy of The Boys Season 1 on Blu-ray, which is also open to the 9th of June. Win a copy of The Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabuse. That's open to the 31st of May. Win a copy of Fistful of Dynamite on Blu-ray, 29th of May. Win a copy of Sea Fever on Blu-ray, which is open to the 2nd of June. And win a copy of Rio Grande on Blu-ray, which is open to the 20th of May. So you'll need to get a shift on, on that one. Those are the, they're all then open to uh, eligible AV forums members resident in the UK. Basically, they're open to everyone except Phil. We've covered this. So, yeah, yeah. Unle unless you are Phil Hinton, in or which case, do it right, presumably. well, yeah, I suppose he probably it's probably considered bad form for him to enter the competitions. But it, it doesn't seem to specifically uh, specifically deny him the chance to do it. <laughs> no, so, his no choice. it's just me. It's just me. Uh, and we have a previous winner as well, uh, Fontabug. Yep. Won the uh, Yamaha YAS 109 all in one simple soundbar worth £329. So well done, them. And Thank I hope you. they're enjoying that. So, yeah, good prize. Excellent. Good stuff. Well, congratulations to our competition winners. Uh, lots of competitions there for you to go and enter. And we'll be back with our hardware section in a sec. So, uh, hardware-wise, we've got a couple of uh, things to go through. Well, I was going to say a couple of things to go through there. Ed's already spoken about the campfire, yeah. so we don't need to do that now. Um, so, very quickly, uh, BenQ TK850 4K DLP projector. I've been looking at that over the last couple of weeks. It is the bigger brother to the TK810, which I reviewed uh, a few weeks back. Um, like a lot of these 4K DLP projectors, it's priced at £1,350, uh, round about that. And um, it offers some interesting features at that price point. So it is a, a slightly better machine than the uh, the 810 in a number of areas. The, the first is that it's more, it's not a home cinema projector, but it's definitely uh, more acceptable with, with uh, movies than the 810. The 810, the problem was it had no contrast. It was something like 400 and something to one in terms of contrast. Where the, the 850 really does make a difference is it has a dynamic iris. Um, you have three settings for the iris. Now, you do see it moving in and out, but I was prepared to put up with that because it certainly improves the contrast uh, that is available. You're looking at around about 2,800 to 1 uh, for HDR. So when it gets an HDR10 signal, um, it's certainly uh, at that point... Um, it, it ups the uh, the brightness, um, it, but it keeps the blacks without turning them completely grey. I mean, blacks are dark grey, but without getting completely uh, greyish in terms of uh, uh, the blacks. And um, in SDR, it's I think it's 2,000 to 1 on the top dynamic iris setting. And like I say, I was prepared to put up with that. Um, 
tact for the the, the, the reason that yeah, it improved the contrast. There's also frame interpolation on there if you're interested in sports, and this is the what the projector is sold as. It's sold as big screen sports home entertainment projector. It's and shame it, there's no sport. Oh no, there's um you can watch surreal Bundesliga matches yep. in silence. Yeah, they're really weird. Yeah, so unfortunately the market for this projector suddenly disappeared for a little <laughs> while because. You know, when they released the projector, we were going to have the Euros and then we were going to have the Olympics and so on. So it has frame interpolation on there for that. So it does smooth the judder out. Um, doesn't necessarily add in any extra detail, though. Um, certainly when I run some line tests, it didn't appear to uh, to up the, the res in any way um, using the frame interpolation. Um, like all 4K DLP projectors, it uses the 0.47-inch DMD chip, uh, which does a quadruple pixel shift um technique which fools your eye into seeing 8.3 million pixels on the screen so 4k resolution on the screen um it's not a 4k resolution native 4k resolution projector certainly not at that price point but it does work um and when you're watching content you wouldn't know that um uh, uh that it's it's doing the upscaling um so yeah there's lots of things uh, of interest with this projector. Certainly the black levels are not as bad as they are on some of these 4K DLP projectors. So it truly is a, a multi-use um, projector um, and you you may be interested in it at that price point. Um, it's certainly for people who don't have a cinema room, um, who don't have a light-controlled room in any way. It's for people who have a normal living room with light-coloured walls and light-coloured ceiling and all the rest of it. It's not very accurate out of the box, although I was able to calibrate it and make sure that it, it was accurate out of the box thanks to the calibration controls on there. Unfortunately, at £1,350, you're not going to pay 300 quid to have it professionally calibrate so that is the issue um but overall as a multi-use machine or something that is budget will give you a nice 100 inch um image to look at from not too far away um i think i had it at 10 10 foot 8 inches for a 94 inch uh screen on my 235 um screen so yeah um uh, recommended because it does what it says on the tin not because it's a home cinema projector it's not a home cinema projector but if you want something for gaming um for big screen sports and that kind of thing it's very very decent at the money um and worth checking out if that is of interest to you so the review will be up this week um on the forums so and there's also a video as well so the video will go up on our youtube channel um looking at tuesday or wednesday for that review to go up and, and the video to go up as well on our youtube channel so so yeah if you're looking for something like that it could be worth looking at so at this point we're also going to look at some of the questions that have been coming in and the first question that i need to uh, go and find very very quickly because uh, conversation has moved on rather um adrian Calif, he donated 20 pounds adrian thank you very much for your donation mm. it really is appreciated um and i am assuming that this is a super chat one as well because it popped up in orange yes. and red and really stood out on the page so um some really interesting questions here i'm going to I'm going to answer this quickly and I'm going to pass it on to the other guys as well because we've all got our own views on this one because it is a bit of a hot potato. Um, <laughs> That's one word for it. Yep. Um, so what are your thoughts on sound insulation, right? So let's let's look at isolating AV equipment and speakers and so on. There's nothing wrong with doing that, um, especially if you've got a player uh, with moving mechanisms and so on. If you can dampen that and stop transmission to signal or, or base or whatever through, through that... Um, that is well worth your time. Uh, I'm not going to say that's not worth worth your while. It, it's not worth spending £400 on four bits of wood that have been nicely carved to go under your CD player. That's taking things to um, almost snake oil uh, when you get to that level. Um, you can isolate AV equipment very, very cheaply, very cost-effectively, make it look nice. And um, I'm not going to say it's, it'll improve the sound because it won't, but it, what it'll do is it'll isolate that piece of equipment. So... Um, it won't find any issues. Um, and, and mainly you're talking about transmission issues, um, you know, vibrations and that kind of thing, especially if you're talking about, it, well, Ed will talk about turntables and so on. It was one of the, the you know, the bane's of my life was was isolating a turntable when you've got, you know, um, 16 subwoofers and 36,000. You, you, you had an unbalanced system <laughs> on that one. Yeah, well, you know, that, but I learned a lot about acoustics and, and that kind of thing through, uh, through doing that line of work. Um, so that's what I'd say on that. In terms of... Cables, now I'm going to separate this out. Cables and internet connects. So you have your analog 
side um, speaker cables and uh, interconnects and so on, and then you have your digital side, um, so USB cables and short HDMI lengths and that kind of thing. Um, digital, get something that's well built, it's going to last you a little while, don't spend a fortune. Um, it's ones and zeros, the ones and zeros are not going to change. Um, uh, with your, HDMI cables, just make sure it's got the, the blooming light. Just see the actual licenses and the logo. Yeah, yep, yep. I was just coming on to that. Yeah, I was coming on to that, Ed. So you've got your license side. And as well, uh, if you're getting over five metres, um, that's where it pays to actually check out all that side of things because obviously it needs to send um, signals down. It also needs to send power. Um, some over five uh, meters could be an issue, so check that out. So digital, you shouldn't see any real differences in performance. We've done all the tests, haven't we, Steve? Um, in the past with that, and yep. um, we haven't seen any. We've measured them and, and so on. There's a complete article on the subject. On, there is. On the side. Yes. Um, we get onto analog side again. It's um, sorry, but we've got some real issues with audio. So, uh, Mark, could you mute if you aren't already muting, just to see if that solves that audio issue? There you go, live. <laughs> get all the issues um so yeah unfortunately something wrong with uh with Max. <laughs> that Mike massive there. fancy headset of his <laughs> um, apparently working um, on fm so i'm gonna hand over to the other guys adrian but certainly you know just a bit of common sense when it comes to cables um when you're talking about analog signals and that kind of thing, um, you you will find differences in interconnects and speaker cables. They're not going to be night and day. Um, and spending two thousand pounds a meter on a speaker cable is not suddenly going to make it sound amazing. Um, there is a lot of snake oil. It's just being aware of of you know the physics of of, of what what's been discussed and um, reading out. Reading the forums, basically, because forum members won't give you any of the snake oil. Um, they will tell you their experiences and so on. Um, trust the forum members. They, uh, they are a valuable resource. Um, and certainly, you know, I, I wouldn't dream of spending a lot of money on cables at all. So um, that's my advice. I'm going to go ahead next because I think the, the analog side is the, is the interesting side because sometimes people take the digital message and mix it up with the analog message. Yeah. That's fair to say. Turntables, the more isolation you can give to them, the better. Um, they are, unfortunately, um, amongst their many failings, they are very sensitive to external interference. So a decent isolation platform, uh, or even better, a wall shelf uh, for devices like that will, will pay you back many times over. Um, they are um, it, it, there's it, there's a reason why the Ragers, the projects of this world, have wall shelves as part of their um, part of their lineup. Uh, there's a Rager Planer 10 um, here. Uh, the, the very kind um, uh, sort of uh, generosity of Riga uh, allowing it to, um, to to remain here as a test item. Uh, that's a not inconsequentially expensive turntable. It permanently lives on a little quadraspire isolation platform. Um, it's not terribly expensive, it's 120 quid or something. It does make a significant difference. And that's with a turntable which has actually got some quite clever feet on it. Um, Obviously, there are suspended record players, and they're a different case again because they, they, they are providing their own isolation. The other wild card for isolation uh, is if you have a product with valves in. Um, valves are microphonic. So if you uh, have a lot of vibration through the air or through the chassis itself, they can, they can actually produce some audible nasties uh, as a result of that. So they also can benefit very strongly from uh, the same sort of behavior that you'd give a turntable. Although I strongly recommend if you are considering wall mounting a valve amplifier that your walls are very solid indeed because they are very heavy. Uh, so again, just a platform, um, uh, it doesn't again it doesn't have to be expensive one of the, the age old fixes used to be a paving slab um or you know from a garden center for patio tiles and stuff like that um they work pretty well for this uh you might find that they're a bit brutalist in terms of their appearance but they work extremely well um so things like that will get the job done uh extremely well um but uh, that's uh, uh, otherwise, once you get into solid state amplification, digital, et cetera, it's the same things that Phil was saying. It, it's, 
it's not ever going to do you any harm but it's not going to um it's not going to, it, I, I don't think it's going to give you any I enormous benefits uh cabling uh again analog and again turntable analog if you're dealing with the output signal from a record player um the i mean you're talking moving core cartridges if you've got 0.3 millivolts being outputted it doesn't hurt for it to be a reasonably good conductor but again it need not be terribly expensive for that to be the case um i would also say that shielded interconnects do work quite well under those circumstances as well because again it's a limited signal and you just want to make sure that it doesn't um it doesn't do you any harm uh, it's never going to be a problem if you've if you if you've done that sort of work so though those would be the, the caveats um when it comes to more ornate cabling there's two two considerations firstly a number of companies uh, are quite happy to um uh, let you try them on a sale or return basis so it's not going to hurt to try them and if you find it makes a difference go for it the other thing is um they don't wear out uh the reason some of these things are priced the way that they are is because fundamentally they're probably going to be the last set of cables that a manufacturer ever sells to you i mean i um you know in terms of reviewing i'm constantly plugging and unplugging things and a number of the interconnects i've had here are are getting on for 20 years old and they still work exactly the same way as they did the day the day they turned up so when we look at the pricing of the oh that's intergalactic margin and all the rest of it that you know you can make an argument you can make whatever put uh, value decisions that you choose to but it has it um, it's not the same as selling a piece of electronic equipment because for the most part it's just going to work indefinitely and that's um that's something to consider so yeah that would be my my go-to on those on 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 that as a as a as a as a point um Phil's comments on, on advice on the forums is, is, is absolutely correct. People w are very unlikely to go down the path of, of plugging things that genuinely do not work. Equally, um, forums um, can be – I mean, we've got a reasonable crux of turntable users now. People can apply lessons that they are perfectly correct for digital sources to analog sources, and that's not quite the same thing. They're, they're, uh, they're finicky, and they do benefit from things that make no difference to your digital equipment. So – approach certain problems with a with a, a a wider search than 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 you might for 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 more conventional questions yeah just question 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 and don't spend a fortune you know there, there is nothing out there in, in the cable world that i think is worth some of the money that's being charged because it's not um so just bear that in mind buy it something looks that's, really cool, though. i mean if you want to set house yeah, pipes <laughs> yeah well that's it but you know um the, the bit of advice I always give to people is don't spend a fortune and buy something that's going to last. So look at the materials, look at the certification and so on, on, on what it is that you're buying. If it looks like it's been nicely made, it probably has and it probably will last and it'll, it'll do what it says on the tin. Steve, anything to add on to that? No, no, I, I think both of you have covered it really. Um, like you said, Phil, I mean, the majority of my interconnects uh, are HDMI. So as long as they're high-speed cables, reasonably well made, they can handle 18 gig. Uh, currently, obviously, things will change with HDMI 2.1 and 48 gig, but as things currently stand, as long as they can handle 18 gig, that'll cover everything you're currently doing. And um, I mean, I've got I've got XLR connectors that I'm currently using, um, and I just use some fairly standard speaker cable, um, nothing too fancy, as long as it gets the job done. Uh, like you say, Phil, if you're buying something that looks flash and you're buying it because it looks flash and you're prepared to pay the money, that's fine. That's up to you. It's a free country. But don't expect it to sound any better just because it's you know it looks really cool. Um, you know, it, there's plenty of Amazon basic stuff does the job very nicely a lot of the time and will cost you buttons. So, you know, always bear that in mind. Yeah. Uh, the only you know caveat to that is long HDMI runs, you need yes. to spend a bit more money on those. In their infinite um, wisdom, it was only ever spec to a maximum of five meters. Is yeah, once you go beyond five yeah. meters, you need to look at alternative op options, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. But, uh, but certainly a one meter, two meter, three meter HDMI cable, you know, don't go spending any money on that because you're just, it's literally, you're not, not going to see a difference. So, um, or there won't be a difference, basically. It's digital signals, ones and zeros. So, uh, yeah. Um, but by the same token, as Ed said, you know, you don't want something that's going to fall apart either. So get something well made just because it's nice to have a good solid connector that you know you can use for years and it's not going to fall apart on you. 
Yeah, yep. there's um, I mean, there's a weird one for this. Um, I only have one lightning cable because it's just charging the old iPad that my son uses. Um, but I got fed up with um the I mean the official ones just aren't terribly good. Um, so I that one of the Amazon ones. It's not an Amazon Basics one. I can't remember what it is. But um, I don't know. It, I don't think it has a single performance advantage other than the fact that it's worked for a whole year. And um, that's uh, that, that's about as exciting as it gets for for, for, for digital cables. Um, <laughs> it can occasionally be worth be worth spending fractionally more than the absolute bare minimum because they don't come apart on you. And uh, I mean, it's specifically relevant to things which are hot plugged, so USB and uh, and lightning. I mean, unless you are sad sacks like uh, ourselves, where we review things and we're continuously connecting and disconnecting things. Otherwise, it shouldn't make any significant difference. Uh, once you've made the connection, it's there for however long you have the piece of equipment. Yep. Um, Steve's going to quickly look at the uh, question that came in about the subwoofers, which is on the running order, Steve, because you're our subwoofer guy at the minute. You've uh, you've been looking at a few of those. So Steve's going to answer that in a second. Gordon Wheeler, um, what does filmmaker mode equate to... D Sorry, does filmmaker mode equate to DV in another name? Uh, no, what filmmaker mode basically does, uh, the easiest way to think about it is that it, it is one button click to put the TV into the most accurate picture setting with all the unnecessary processing switched off. Um, so what manufacturers have been doing recently is in the cinema modes and even in some of the ISF modes, they have been leaving uh, the motion smoothing switch to low or, or on or noise reduction switch to low and so on. Basically, what Filmmaker does is it switches everything off. So you know that as soon as you put it in the Filmmaker mode, there is nothing being applied that shouldn't be. It's a D65 white Rec 7094 HD, um, or if you're feeding an HDR signal, it'll be uh, D65 white again, uh, but BT 2020 uh, for colour, uh, which is obviously going to be DCI-P3 because it's now wider than that at the minute. So that's basically what Filmmaker does. Um, there is a bit of confusion. It's caused by some of the press not understanding picture modes, and they think there's something going on there that that's uh, that they're, they're immediately against some of them. Um, and I don't know why. It's basically it's there. It's it's a choice that you can make to switch everything off, and it will switch everything off. So you're just seeing it as it should be, right, Steve? Uh, the the um, super oh, chat I question. Can't, not, I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> it's at the bottom. Viewer donations and questions. Um, no, I, I can't see it. It's not showing up on my screen. Right. Okay. So uh, Polo. Uh, Favina, I think that's correct. He's donated ten pounds. I have an Atmos system with a pair of BMW 703 S2s as the front speakers. Should I go for a pair of Rel T9i or a pair of BK BK P12 300 SBPRs? Uh, I haven't seen that particular Rel model, but based on my experience with BK, um, you really can't go wrong with their subwoofers. Uh, I mean, bang for buck. Performance-wise, everything you get in the package, uh, build quality as well. I mean, they are exceptional subwoofers for the money, and their performance is also exceptional. So um, definitely, if those are if those are what you're considering. Two of those would do the job spectacularly well, <laughs> um, and I think you'd be very, very happy. I mean, they really are incredible subs. I mean, just go and look on the go have a look on 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 the threads, and you'll see. A number of AV forums members uh, who've got a BK sub, and they are delighted with them, and I can see why. They the are. Thing is that the, the praise isn't. It's not just you know a one forum thing. You go anywhere, and people don't. I I I don't recall seeing anyone with a bad word to say about BK unless they actually made some words themselves. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, they um <laughs> it, it it's um I mean I've still got a P three hundred SB. Um, uh, it doesn't see an enormous amount of use these days. It's only when certain smaller speakers turn up. But, I mean, still for the asking price, it's a monumentally capable piece of equipment. Um, and yeah. as Steve says, it's built, It you know, there are things I have here which cost considerably more than that, and they're not built anything like as well as that that VK is. Uh, um, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I've got a, a monolith that will be approaching 15 years old, round about that. Um and when I use that, I'm still amazed at the performance that you get out of the, yeah. out of the, the box. They, they do go make deep, really good. Yeah. They go deep, 
but they're responsive, they're tight, they're they're just really good subs. And um, I mean, I've 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 reviewed and tested subs three or four times the price that aren't as good. They they are they are genuinely no. I mean, yes, they're competitively priced, but they're also really good. So um, I think if that's on your list, you're you're in the right ballpark there <laughs> with those. Yeah. Um quickly get through some of these so phil saying uh, gents phil and steve uh, what's your take on lg's new uh, hdmi 2.1 inputs to 40 gigabits per second um i don't think it's going to make a difference phil um oh. it'd be nice to have 48 gigabits per second but 48 gigabits per second is for an 8k signal you're talking about lg 4k tvs they don't need um 48 gigabits per second for anything uh, even the new gaming consoles uh, they won't need that because they won't be able to take a, an 8k signal because of 4k tvs so um i can see why lg have done it it was a bit naughty not to mention it yeah um yeah. and it's it's been discovered by people um you know, using devices that can look at the uh, the HDMI's and tell what the signal it will take. Um, so it was a bit disappointing that LG haven't mentioned that they were cutting back, but I can completely understand why. There's no need for it. There's no need for a 48 gigabits per second uh, HDMI 2.1 input on a 4K TV. Um, you can do everything you need to do, and the majority of stuff that you do need can be done over 2.0 anyway. So... Um, so yeah, uh, the only thing I would say there is I thought it was a little bit cheeky of LG not to, not to actually mention that, and it had to be found out by uh, other people looking at that. Um, and what else is there, Steve? Um, any thoughts on the trend of 4K releases of old movies neutering the base? War of the Worlds is the latest victim. Base falls off a cliff after 30 hertz. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I don't want them to do that. Obviously, <laughs> if that's what's happening. Uh, I assume studios, I don't know why studios would be doing that unless they're, uh, cons- I mean, you know, it makes no sense, does it? You, you've got a format that can deliver bass down to there, and it's mixed that way originally, so why would you not want to do that? But unfortunately, it is something that's been coming, been happening more and more often. Um, certainly, Disney are guilty of it, perhaps more than most, in terms of, um, of their mixes being not quite as bass heavy as I was expecting, um, and also being mixed quieter i mean you can turn it up but you don't kind of say put back the lfe effects if they're not there um yeah i i've my my discs on the way i haven't heard the new war of the worlds yet but if it's been if it's not got the deep bass that i'm expecting from that disc i should be deeply disappointed yeah um again i'm along the same lines as steve i completely agree with steve i I know why they do it because they uh they have a trend at the minute where they they will do a home pass um on soundtracks at the minute in fact we spoke to um Oh, his name's just gone completely out of my head. Um, uh, uh, Pinewood, who, who was it? Yeah, the um, um, Glenn, Glenn, was it Glenn? Yeah, Glenn. I, I really do have sound, if, He was the sound designer <laughs> for Danny Boyle. Name. Yeah. Um, but he was mentioning about doing the home passes and so on, and he keeps everything in in his mixes. But, um, yeah, there's some studios making the decision um, to filter it out. It could be that they see it as valuable to do that for whatever reason it Maybe is to them. thinking most people are going to be watching it on a phone or a TV or a system without a separate, you know, a single bar sound bar, you know, single unit sound bar, you know, and, and that most people don't have the capability of delivering that deep bass and therefore they don't think it's important. But clearly, you know, I don't see why you wanted to have it there anyway, even if the device you're listening at watching on can't deliver the deep bass. At least is it, it not sync. more of a case, ironically, I don't think it's phones. It's when you actually have um, more affordable soundbars and so on and so forth, where they're going to have a stab at reproducing some of these sounds and it's going to induce cabinet resonance and, and odd noises and so on and so forth. Um, it's it's a similar argument to um, some of the, the things put forward about the loudness war with mastering of stereo albums years ago. Um, it comes down to... I mean, the, the only way to overcome it is um, that there's either um, the ability to to flag, uh, so a device, you know, reads the disc or reads the file and goes, I, I can only do up to X, and ignores a, t- a subset which is then available for full range equipment, uh, or we simply develop to a point where more affordable stuff doesn't make farting noises and sad noises when it's doing 30 hertz. Or sub yeah. thirty hertz. Yeah. It, uh, 
I'd rather that everything was in the signal. Um, well, I, I'd, I'd, in the same so. way, Phil, I'd rather that there was some headroom in my stereo mixes. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's another area where compression really has come in and and killed um, quite a bit of the, some recordings. So, but it's nice to see that there's actually a movement now to get back to how things were done in the past. Ed and certainly cutting vinyl and so on has been uh, been a lot of movies, uh, movies, a lot of moves uh, in that direction. So, oh no, no, to- we, we've we, music is if you wanted some hope and optimism that you can make it through this period of uncertainty. There's music has music has improved. Uh, there's uh, tremendous benefits um some of some of the more mi- recent releases of even very mainstream popular uh albums have been they they simply have more guts than they uh, ever you know had 10 15 years ago the only catch is of course uh, is that you guys are racing the availability of physical media um so whether they're waiting for it to be corrected may also mean that it it doesn't necessarily exist on a physical disc. Yeah, so it was uh, Richard Sim 7 that, that um, brought that question up. It's a good question. I know it's been happening for a little while. Um, it's it's certainly something I wish would go away. I wish they would go back to having everything on the disc. Um, what TV size would you say when sitting eight feet away as big as possible? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, my answer was going to be just get the biggest TV you can afford <laughs> or that you can fit in that space. Eight feet's not that far away from a TV. But I think you said you've got 50 inches and it looks a bit small. Yeah. Get 60, 65. 65. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think 65 is probably perfect at, at that distance. As long as you're watching HD and 4K, um, don't watch SD channels. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it'll look I'm, I'm about five foot from 77 inches. And um, as I said at the start of this show, Under Siege looked well rough. <laughs> <laughs> as, as did Adventures of a Taxi Driver, which I was also watching on uh, Saturday. Oh, God, they've all appeared on Amazon, haven't they? Yeah, and Steve, honestly... Steve, come on. We have the internet now. There is unlimited pornography I, at your disposal. I know, but you there's don't something... don't need to watch Adventures of a Taxi Driver. There's a strange pleasure to be had from seeing some 70s Bristols. I've never so. heard it called that before. But no, OK, fine. Um, what do you think on that one, Mark? Uh, eight feet away, what, what screen size would you go for? And praying that his audio works. Am I normal? Yes. Yay. Yay. It was that damn headset. <laughs> it looked very smart. It, it just... looked apart, yeah. Um, you, feel like, you feel like you're about to land some aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> An aircraft carrier or something. Eight feet away, I think you're at that point where if, if you're looking at any kind of, you know, SD signal, then 55 inch. If you're, as you said, HD and 4K, then go 65 inch, I think. I, I think any larger than that would be. I. It's always wrong to say you can't go too large, but a, occasionally there are people who do regret it. You know, they might not admit it, but you know, as Steve said, it, it kind of it starts to. I think you don't want a screen size that starts to completely limit your choice of what content you can play. You know, and occasionally you will want to slum it a little bit, like it, <laughs> m- the. Compression I've been getting recently from stuff on Netflix. It's I, I've been basing certain things that I'm choosing to view because I'm just thinking, I know that's not going to look that great at the moment. You know, I know it's getting absolutely caned at peak hours, and so like I'm working my way through most '70s kung fu films on Netflix at the moment. <laughs> I'm going to make my way onto Amazon next. They've just released a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So we. Desperately need to move on to movies because we are we're running well long, <laughs> running quite long. Um, obviously, we said we were going to mess with the format this week. We'll we'll learn some lessons and and you know see where things go. Uh, so just to wrap up on some of the questions, um, I, I I think I've got them all apart from uh, Richard Sim Seven again. Thanks, Richard, for all your questions. Is there a difference between BT eighteen eighty six and two point four gamma on LG OLEDs, or specifically on LG OLEDs? There is a difference between eighteen eighty six and two point four. It's at the very low end. Yeah. Um, and uh, 1886 is, is slightly better coming out of black. But, um, uh, and I think this is what you're trying to get, at. some TVs that might look like uh, posterization coming out of black, you might see that, whereas 2.4 would cover that over. You're talking about walk, watching in a very dark room to see issues at that level of the picture, but very, very, very slight differences between uh, 1886 and 2.4. I tend to prefer power gamma. Um, 2.4. Yeah. There uh, was a question uh, about the Kef R3. I ha- I'm sorry, I haven't listened to Kef R3. Um, 
uh, it's on the it's been requested. So as and when uh, if things continue to ease up, I'll be be looking at some Kef product and we're taking it from there. But at the moment, it's not a speaker that I have a, a, a tremendous amount of, of experience with. Uh, I did listen to a full set of R's, but big ones uh, for uh, in an AV situation but that was floor standards front and rear which may or may not be representative of what sane people would be doing um was very good though so uh, yeah um but no there's no I have, i'm afraid of no direct experience at the moment uh Eamon, uh difference between the c9 and c10 uh, bfi 120 hertz you checked out the bfi on the on the uh, g10 didn't you steve yeah, yeah i did um and it's it's better definitely they've really improved that that's the one thing they've definitely improved over the last couple of years um the bfi works really well now previously there was a ton of flicker um now i appreciate that p different people perceive flicker differently so whilst it so if i say i didn't have a problem with it it doesn't mean to say you won't <laughs> but you shouldn't uh, i didn't have any problems with it they've done some really they've done some really good solid work on on the bfi now obviously adding black frames does d you know diminish the brightness so you can't use it for hdr but uh, for sdr it's a, it's actually a really good way of improving motion without uh, adding any artifacts. Yeah, okay, so um, apologies if we haven't answered your question in hardware section. I've been through it three or four times now. Um, I think we have answered every question that's been asked, so thank you very much for that. Hopefully, um, the answers have been useful to you. Uh, we need to go to movies, so movies is coming up next. So moving on to the movie section, uh, obviously we're still in lockdown, so there's no cinema releases to talk about really. Um, and obviously Kaz is not here this evening. Um, uh, Kaz has got his fingers on the pulse with what is being released on streaming service and so on ahead of time uh, before the cinema. But because we're at home, uh, there's lots of things that we can out watch and I'm sure Steve's been watching lots and lots and lots. So he'll be able to answer a lot of what's going on here. Um, so what can we watch, Steve, at home on 4K or Blu-ray this week? Right. On 4K um, this week, we have 1917. Uh, I, I've already got my disc. Uh, I got it quite a while ago, actually, uh, from the US. I would say this is one of the best looking and one of the best sounding discs I've ever seen. Um, it's 4K DI. The photography uh, was fantastic. The disc itself delivers that image. 2.35 to 1, I should point out, because if you saw it in IMAX, it was 1.9 to 1 aspect ratio. But the disc is 2.39 to 1. Uh, the picture is absolutely stunning. The level of detail is astonishing. The soundtrack is amazing. Because of the nature of the film, it's a single take. Uh, the sound is incredibly directional. Uh, and the Atmos mix is awesome. Um, the amount of directional effects, like when they first start moving across no man's land, they could pass some dead horses and they're rotting and you can, the butterflies are all buzzing around your head and all around you. Two biplanes fly overhead and you can distinctly hear two different planes flying overhead. Um, when they're, uh, they, I don't want to give away too much because I don't want to give away what happens in the film, but basically it's an amazing soundtrack and it's an incredible picture. So if you're looking for, it, it's also a great film. So it's, it I mean, it's, it, all-round winner there um but yeah it's going to be one of the demo discs everyone starts getting out to show their friends um you know particularly when it comes to atmos uh and it looks and sounds spectacular and um and it's a really good movie so i recommend that highly uh if you've got if you're looking for 4k disc to buy get that one uh if you don't do 4k and you do three um blu-ray then certainly blu-ray also looks great uh also out this week we've got justice league dark apocalypse apocalypse war uh, which, according to Kaz's notes, is the DC Animated Universe's answer to Marvel's Endgame. Uh, I have not seen it. I know little about it. Um, but um, if you're into DC animation, that's coming out. Also, Anaconda, uh, which if it's the film I'm thinking it is, <laughs> I might get that because that was a bit of a guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> with an absolutely awesome performance from John Voight. Um, and also Mystery Man, which is another film that I really liked I haven't seen for years. I think these are probably new on Beat, Beat It and Blu-ray, so worth checking out. Also, Bombshell, uh, I think that's the film uh, about Fox, uh, which also had really good reviews when it came out, so it might be worth checking out. And um, we've got Destry Rides again. That's a Criterion release. Sorry, just moving a bit. Destry Rides again, which is a Criterion release. And I can't see my notes. Um, <laughs> and also competition prize and the specialist, which is a Eureka competition prize and throwdown also from Eureka. That's a competition prize as well. So that's all out this week on Blu-ray, but I don't know a lot of those later films to be perfectly honest. Just yeah. Mystery, Mystery Man. Yeah. Mystery, Mystery Man. Man. 
that's yeah. become a bit of a cult classic. It, it's gained a, a greater following, it seems. I don't think it's ever been on Blu-ray before either. Uh, so right. it might be, might be a debut there, which uh, which is, I, I think I'll pick up that, and I'm going to definitely pick up Anaconda. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, just quickly going back to 1917, I've got to say one of the uh, best IMAX experiences I've had for a long time. It was uh, exceptional. Um, I actually went to see it twice. I saw it in 240 to 1 on a normal screening and, and in IMAX. And um, what I wasn't disappointed with either format um, or either framing. It just looks superb. Roger Deakins is, uh, is my favourite cinematographer. He's uh, He is a master when it comes, especially doing... light. Speaking um, of podcasts from earlier in the show, he does a podcast quite regularly now with his wife and his son uh, about cinematography. So you might want to check it out, Phil. I think I will check that one out. Thanks very much. I just apologise there. Um, obviously, the back soon, you assume I've gone and done a comfort break or something like that. I didn't mute. Terribly unprofessional. The reason for this is um, we've we didn't got hear in- any flushing, though. So obviously, you didn't go for a comfort break. <laughs> no, we've got endangered moths in Milton Keynes. And my cat, which is never all the caught... excuses. No, 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 I'm not making this up. My cat, which is never called Real men anything, going bottles. keeps bringing these bloody moths in. And it's like, I don't want to be accused of ecological genocide. So um, it, it's separating cat from moth and then successfully <laughs> bringing moth back out. It, it flew away. So it's an undamaged moth. But, um, yeah, uh, unexpected issues, again, with this whole live business. But, um, Do you feel better for it, though? I d- no, I'm sorry. D- that, you well know, done, th- Greta. You've done it. I know. I d- it, it, I, you know, I, it's just, it just annoys me that I've got two blooming cats and neither of them have caught anything at all up until this point. And then there was this article, you know, it's like, oh, we've had, you know, it's an important year for these extremely rare moths. And. One of them is just really good at catching these extremely rare moths. So, yeah, I've had to separate that. But I'm back now, and and, and the cat's looking at me furious because I've taken his moth away. So, you know. Okay, there we go. Um, right, streaming and TV-wise, um, Steve, what's coming up? Uh, the Lovebirds, which is on Netflix, was due for a cinema release, but Netflix had bought the distribution rights post-COVID. Never heard of it. Have you heard of it? Anyone heard of it? Um, no. No. Uh, we need to explain it. Obviously, Kaz put this together. Yeah, and, and he's, he's not had to here. drop out at the last minute. So, apologies if we're we're stumbling through this like we don't know what we're talking about because we, we don't. <laughs> don't. We, we didn't prepare this. So, um, so yeah, apologies. Uh, yeah, also, Homecoming season two is on Amazon. Uh, now, season one starred Julia Roberts. This does not star Julia Roberts. So, obviously, either they couldn't afford her, I assume. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you enjoyed season one, uh, season two is now will be on Amazon this week, I believe. Um, um, but be aware, this one does not star Julia Roberts. So I didn't see Homecoming. It looked interesting, but there's just too much there's bloody too telly. Much telly. And, yeah. I don't, yeah. and, every, and given that every time I encounter Twister, I have to watch it. I mean, the difficulties with watching new things is problematic. So well, you know. when, when Steve says there's too much telly, there's too much telly. Yeah. There's too much telly. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is now. Obviously, pretty soon there'll be no telly. Because they haven't been making anything for the last year. <laughs> Time for Only well, Fools and Horses reruns. They're, uh, they're going to make Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Um, it's been announced by CBS. It's following Pike, Spock, and uh, number one from uh, Discovery. Thank God for that. Um, <laughs> it, it's the only thing in Discovery, season yeah. two is Discovery, that I liked. I thought, I want more Pike. I want more of this. Um, but will it go the way of Picard? Um really bitterly disappointed with Picard. It it showed some promise right at the very beginning and then just went up its own backside yeah. as quickly as... I will not be watching season two of Picard. I'm not watching season three of Discovery, but I will watch this. At least give this a, a, a fair shake. Yeah, yeah. but is it um, uh, Alex... Um, what's his face? Yeah, well, I guess it's, it? let's see who the showrunner is and who's going to be writing and this sort of stuff. But, um, I mean, I like the people that were playing Pike, Spock in number one. So... Um, yeah. That had that, they, those were easily the best bits of Discovery Season 2. Uh, and so if they can do a decent... I mean, well, look at how difficult, is it? Just send them off on their five-year mission. Yeah, <laughs> and explore exactly. some strange new worlds. I it's mean, in the, the title. <laughs> the problem was with Discovery was they were trying to shoehorn in a character that had never existed in the Star Trek universe, um, who was suddenly, uh, you know, related to Spock and everything else. And it's like, this doesn't make any sense. But when you got Pike, Spock, and number one, that made sense because there is... A bit of history. The first pilot uh, of Star Trek was um, w- was that set up, and it, and it yeah. You know, so it shows promise. But if it's got the same writing team, uh, I'm not, not too sure. Um, uh, and I'm really looking forward to Mr. Plinkett's um, review of Picard. It's taken a while. 
for it yeah, to come. But I think gonna, uh, it's going to be uh, it's, it's going to be, be savage. Really <laughs> as, as soon as that video drops on YouTube, I am dropping everything to watch it. Um, yeah, you kind of beat that. Um, Star Wars news, Steve. Mandalorian season two. Mandalorian season two is really filling out now in terms of uh, obviously they've all we spoke about this a few weeks ago, but Rosario Dawson's going to be playing a live action version of uh, Ashoka Tano on the show. But they've also, and, and this is not a surprise because I think there's a, there's, if you've seen season one, there's a brief scene where they're on Tatooine and you see someone's cloak and a boot. And I thought, oh, is that meant to be Boba Fett? Yeah, it's Boba Fett. Boba Fett's going to be in this, uh, in this season, in season two of The Mandalorian, played by Tamura Morrison, who played Jango Fett in, um, and also all the clones in the prequels. So Boba Fett's back. And also Bo Katan, who's a character from The Clone Wars, uh, and also I think Rebels. Uh, and she's voiced by Katie Sackhoff in the animated versions, but Katie Sackhoff's going to be playing a she's Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica, the um, re, re, no, the remake, um, and she's going to be playing the character herself in uh, in season two as well. So it looks like um, I'm judging from this that uh, Dave Filoni's really taking control of season two. It seems to be bringing all of his favourite characters into it. Um, but I'm really looking forward to this because I enjoyed season. Have you finished it yet, Phil? I no. Get yeah. on with it. Yeah. Well, it's only eight episodes and only about 35 minutes long. Yeah, I know. I've got that and I've got Westworld to get finished. And I'm oh, going to well, do that, we'll gonna do that this, this this week. I'm going to do that. And just Westworld's another show that I'm done with. <laughs> right. Oh, well, let me find out first why and uh, before you spoil it. Um, right, so to wrap up, because we are we're supposed to finish in it. <laughs> Supposed to finish in about four minutes, but um, it looks like we're going to be over time a little bit. Um, and hopefully, in the chat window, you've been adding your uh, Tom Cruise because we're going to talk about our favorite, best, and worst Tom Cruise movies. Um, for me, um, and I'm going to go first because there's, there's two I really want to mention. I want to mention War of the Worlds because I don't think it gets enough credit. Um, I think it's oh my god, it's, sorry, I think Tom Cruise has just cropped up on the, the screen, <laughs> disembodied. Hey, head Tom, of Tom, how are you Cruise? doing? Welcome to the podcast. Um, uh, you, I've lost my train of thought now. Yeah, War of the Worlds. Um, I think it's really underrated. Uh, I think his performance is underrated in it. Um, for me, I thought it was really decent sci-fi. And yeah, I know that there's a, a, a lot of fans of of that book and so on that didn't appreciate the way it was it was done and so on. A lot of people complained about Spielberg's approach. Again, cinematography, everything was blown out and uh, he, he deliberately blew out all the highlights and made everything clip in it. And um, I, I know a lot of people didn't like that. But for me, I thought it was a tremendous piece of work. I really, really did enjoy it. And I think it's so underrated. Uh, the other, Magnolia. Um, don't like the character, but what a performance. Really, really good. I and think I'm, that might be a glimpse at the real Tom Cruise, to be perfectly honest. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> But yeah, again, it was it was a, a another really good performance, um, and I can take him and leave him in Mission Impossible and so on. I mean, it's a lot of what he does is uh, is that type of thing, and he and he does it so well, and he does his own stunts. Space, isn't he? Next and time. I th- and I think he's he is the last leading man in Hollywood. I think he's Hollywood's last leading man in terms of he wants to do everything. He wants to be behind the camera. He wants to do his own stunts, um, and I don't think he gets enough. Uh, credit, I, I don't think, because because of what he does in his private life, or allegedly. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> take you trip down to swell in the corner, are we? <laughs> allegedly. Um, so yeah, um, but in terms of a movie star, he's he's an out and out movie star, and he's probably one of the last leading men. Um, but for me, those are two that I wanted to mention because everything else, uh, unless I'm really forgetting something, is 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 Tom Cruise being Tom Cruise. I think, Steve. Yeah. Born on the 4th of July, he's very good in that. Uh, and not being Tom Cruise, it has to be said. Or rather, he starts off playing the all-American hero and then becomes something else. Uh, he's also very good in Rain Man, if we're talking about his films where he delivers a performance. I think that Mission Impossible Fallout is is one of the best action films I've seen in the last 10 to 20 years. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, personal favourite of mine probably is, uh, is uh, Tropic Thunder. Yeah, I was about to say two words. And yeah, I'm not, yeah, it's just I knew that was coming. Incredible. Um, and again, it's not that's not exactly type standard for Tom Cruise. He's he's clearly enjoying himself tremendously, and it's it's perfection, absolutely fantastic. He's uh, I think he's quite good. He's very good. I like Oblivion. I think he's pretty good in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's generally solid, Tom. I mean, he, he gives it his all. 
Well, uh, I would say Edge, that's, that's Edge of I mean, Tomorrow yes. is probably, I mean, uh, they, because of the slightly futuristic bent to both of them, that there's, there's periods where they blend into one another and yeah. separating scenes. But Edge of Tomorrow, again, there's just the comedic edge, which is done very, very, eff- it's done effortlessly. It, 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 it's, you know, just a natural part of the performance and so on and so forth. Um and uh, it's uh, that's it, just full stop an underrated film as far as I'm concerned. I think it's an absolute cracker. Um, it would have just done better if they'd gone with the strap line as the actual film title. <laughs> uh, Paul mentioned his favourite is uh, Minority Report. Again, another good uh, good choice it's there. Good film. What I was very good film. Was it? So what? Why do you like that one, then, Mark? Um, well, to start with, uh, you've got solid source material. Philip K. Dick stories are usually good. Um, Philip K. Dick story. Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg, a decent budget. You know, it it just it kind of ticks all the all the boxes. You know, he's. I don't know whether Tom Cruise is anyone's favourite actor, but you you don't really get a duff performance from him. You know, uh, and so yeah, that alongside as you mentioned, War of the Worlds. Um, he's done some decent kind of sci-fi stuff. He's done you know some, some pretty good kind of futuristic thrillers and the like. Um, but but the performance in Magnolia is probably the one that stands out, just because it, you suddenly realise that you've probably actually not heard him swear that much in films, you know. Yeah. And it just it the you know particularly when he drops certain words, they just hit you very hard, you know. And it, yeah, it's an excellent performance. It's the scene where he's he's being interviewed and he's not saying anything as I'm quietly judging you. That's really chilling mm-hmm. uh, and telling. Um, I've got to say, I've grown up with Tom Cruise. So for me, I still love some of his early stuff. Uh, he's superb in Taps, which was an early role for him where he plays one of the um, sort of, um, military academy students who goes a bit bonkers. Uh, I love Risky Business, one of my favourite films. Uh, and I, him dancing around to Bob Seger in his underpants is still a classic scene. Um and uh, and the Outsiders actually as well another film where he's part of an ensemble class but that was like the original Brad Pitt film was that before he got his teeth done yes <laughs> and and he, he looks rough in that film yeah. I'll, be honest, I'll be honest <laughs> he's meant to look rough he's playing a greaser but yeah um, he's had a bit of work uh, done. come he's on Steve admit teeth, it that you like cocktail as well <laughs> never seen I've never seen cocktail you lie cocktail. you lie I, like no, I honestly you lie never seen it transparently I suppose um, eyes wide shut um, unfortunately for Tom he gets out off the screen by his, his missus at the time um, and um, may have precipitated their divorce uh, but uh, yeah he's, he's, he's you know you know a cruise is going to give 110% if you just look at the ex- extras on the fallout disc he spent six months learning to fly a helicopter for that film <laughs> and another four months learning to do halo dives I mean you can't um, I assume the halo dive was just you know him under a big fat over a big fan pretending oh no they did it for real yeah yeah everything, everything <laughs> well, he's he off into was... space next yeah. isn't he yeah he's yeah. off into space with Elon Musk so Good luck there, Tom. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, worst Tom Cruise, and, I, and I've got to say, it's a really recent one, or a couple of year old now. But the Mummy. Uh, obviously, yeah, we're trying it's... to get a franchise up and running there. My God, that was bloody awful. Um, I, I almost walked out of the cinema. That's how awful that was. I'd have to go. It, maybe not awful, but disappointing. The Color of Money. I, I, I you like know, the Color of Money. He's good no, enough. Yeah, he, he's he's not bad in it, but it's just the film never should have been made. You know, the hustler is an well, absolute at least stone. Got screw off the back of it. I know, yeah, one over two. Yeah, Paul Newman kind of. Yeah, he's one of those actors who who you say he got it for that. You know, it, it just yeah, that's true. no. I just think it. You know, Scorsese. It, it was one of his kind of missteps. I don't think he should have touched that character. That's just my opinion. Oh, there's a number of these. I've just actually, I mean, you can tell I'm not actually looking at my camera at the moment because I'm looking at the web browser, but um, I'd forgotten, uh, it, but there's some, some good and bad. I enjoyed certainly the first Jack Reacher film. I thought he was quite good in that. Mm-hmm. The second one's a bit of a mess. Um, and then uh, in terms of not a good Tom Cruise film, even though it's quite watchable, uh, is Days of Thunder. And I'm going to explain that. Days of Thunder is quite visually impressive because it's a massive shouty wall of noise um but cole trickle uh he's both a bit of a dick 
And it's not. It, Tom Cruise is clearly not putting, it, it, as you say, normally you get 110% of Tom Cruise. He's not doing very much in that. He's just wandering around looking moody. Um, I mean, the thing, them the, just trying to re, recreate Top Gun, Top Gun on with cars. 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 But the like irony the, is, in the if high you concept are, book, they go through that. And it was just a case of how can we do this again? You know, I know we'll I completely cars. agree. But the irony is, if you did Days of Thunder 2 now, with 50 something year old he'd be driving the nascar at 205 miles an hour in two for days real. to thunder um but it but no the idea that he'd be he'd be you know the 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 the, the, the worn out burnt out bloke from you know being you know facing his new young fresh nemesis called billy bob or whatever um <laughs> that could probably make for an excellent film but um it's, it's really you see that. That ideas away for free here ed <laughs> You're just making me think of the Talladega Nights now. Help me, baby <laughs> Jesus. Help me, Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, if, if nothing else, it did give... Uh, I mean, to be fair, uh, Talladega Nights is pro probably the, the most tellingly accurate depiction yeah. of NASCAR that's ever been committed to film. But, you know, it's... Uh... I, uh, I could chuck in... Uh, actually, if you've read... Uh... Mark mentioned um, high concept, but they do talk about um, Don Simpson actually cast himself as one of the racing drivers in Days of Thunder and then got cut out of his own movie. He was so bad. <laughs> but it was also Don, that, that was the last thing he did before he um, and, uh, cast Don, wasn't it? Uh, um, no, 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 no. He lasted for another 10 years, I think, because it wasn't until the mid. When did they do The Rock? Eight. What year was The Rock? 96? Uh, uh, mid 90s, wasn't it? He was, I mean, he, Don Simpson was chemically inconvenienced he, for most Don of the Don Simpson life. was on 50 different prescription drugs, never mind the illegal stuff, but he died during the oh, production legend. of The Rock. As, um, no, 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 <laughs> this is all, this is not an alleged, this is all in... in no, 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 uh, no, 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 it's a, a matter you of... Can't um, the dead. Plus you can't stand of the dead. He died during the production of The Rock. I know this because... Uh, uh, Jay Bruckheimer came onto the set to announce. Uh, so I'm, I'm very sorry. I have to announce that um, Don Simpson sadly passed away yesterday. And Sean Connery went, "Well, I can't show you. I'm surprised." <laughs> <laughs> a nice one, Sean. I'm going to go top worst Tom Cruise movie for me has to be Far and Away with his lousy Irish oh. accent. That's a stinker. <laughs> Considering how long he spent, like things like learning to fly a helicopter and everything, the accent in that is. He did not. Back then, I don't think he was quite as dedicated as he is now. <laughs> <laughs> and now he'd be talking in fluent Gaelic, wouldn't he? <laughs> but back then, yeah, that was a ropey Irish accent um, and in a pretty ropey film. <laughs> uh, Jenny Maguire? Ed? I hate that. I oh, hate he... that film on a level <laughs> I can't on, even begin to describe. <laughs> Why? It's, it's, it's... I, I just loathe it. I can't tell you why I loathe it as much as I do, but I loathe it. Uh, the only film I've seen in the cinema that I hate more than Jerry Maguire is Carry On Columbus, which is generally regarded to be one of the worst films ever made. I walked out of that one. And Men in Tights. Yeah, well, there you go. I, I just like Men in Tights. I just <laughs> hate it. I hate it, every part of it, all of it. If I never see it again in my lifetime, uh, I'll be a happy camper. Lyson Tactonman's correct far yeah, away was shot yeah. 70 mil. Uh, didn't, didn't make, make it, it any better. better. <laughs> it looked gorgeous, but it was still crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but do you own it, Steve? No, I do not. Oh my God, that is a that's about there. There we go. That's a Rubicon. That tells you how bad it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lyson yeah, man. Uh, Kubrick did a lot of takes in everything, not just Eyes Wide Shut. That was his way. I mean, he would do 70, 80 takes. He spent yeah. so long shooting Eyes Wide Shut that he had, and he shot it twice pretty much because he had to reshoot. Because uh, he kept going for so long, he, he, I think Harvey Keitel was in it and couldn't come back for reshoots, so they had to recast and reshoot all of his stuff. Um, yeah, I think he spent two. Cruz and Kidman spent two years shooting Eyes Wide Shut. Well, he basically sent the actors insane on The Shining. Uh, yes, yes, he he sent sent Jack insane and bullied Shelley, 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 Shelley Duval yeah. quite horribly. I have to say, it's pretty shocking when you watch the behind-the-scenes footage of the way he treated her on that film. I know he got a performance out of her, but, but you can see I don't she's think he'd be allowed to do that. Breakdown. Yeah, yeah, for real, on screen, and it's a bit <laughs> distressing, actually. Yeah. No, it's one that I'd completely forgotten about, but Shaw Singh's just come up with an interview with a vampire. I completely yeah, forgotten about that. Yeah, I like that film. Yeah, I it was not too bad. Yeah. I think he's, he's, he's quite funny in it too. Is it at the end when he's listening when they, they put on the tape of Brad Pitt? He goes, "Oh, moan, moan, moan." I've had to listen to this for three hundred <laughs> years. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember his character. Was it Lestat or something? Yeah, yeah? the vampire yeah. Lestat. Yeah. 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 So I think we've covered everything there. Um, in terms of Tom Cruise and everything else, just got to mention Gonzo Dad, five pound donation. Thank you very much. He says, I'll buy that for a dollar. I'm not sure what you mean uh, well, by that, but um, <laughs> with a name we called are, Gonzo Dad, for a don't want to ask, no but uh, yeah. his name's Darren. So uh, thanks very much, Darren, for your, your donation. Thank you, um, Adrian, for yours and Paul as well. Thank you very much for everybody that's donated this evening. It really is appreciated um, that you take your time. And also, thank you very much. If you have been watching live, um, it's a lot to go through. Um, and we are over time, we're 10 minutes over time at the minute, um, but thank you for sticking with us and uh, seeing it through to the end, and all I need to do now is thank Ed Selly. I'm going to hit the brakes and you're going to fly right by. Steve Withers. I feel the need, the need for speed. And Mark Borry. Sorry to bother you on a Sunday, sir. Oh, is that it? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't call yeah. you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so uh, don't forget you can follow us on facebook and twitter um also bookmark av forums for latest reviews news and videos plus why not leave us a five star rating on itunes but only if you enjoyed the show and of course please subscribe to our youtube channel um it does help the channel it helps us grow the channel and it gets us a better search rating so people can find us easier so if you haven't subscribed already then please do subscribe and of course click the notification bell to find out when we launch new videos uh, but that's it for this week thanks very much yeah and like it yeah and uh that's it thanks very much for watching and listening and you'll see us again next week